All right. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Dmitry Sitrakian. Thanks for coming. Uh, I am one of the founders of GridGain. I'm uh, also chief product officer, and I'm also on PMC of Apache Ignite. So I've been with the project for a while. I know probably GridGain and Apache Ignite products in and out. And today, uh, today we are going to be uh, are going to be talking about uh, memory-centric architecture. And uh, when I was thinking how to actually describe memory-centric architecture and how to describe memory-centric approach, I actually thought that why not actually take you through the evolution of how we got here and look at all the components of distributed storages. I mean, we've been here, this is second day, uh, it's winding down. I think we've heard every in-memory term by now. We've heard the in-memory databases, in-memory data grids. Uh, distributed databases, uh, distributed caches, etc. So I was hoping uh, in a way of uh, showing how it evolved, actually present uh, uh, all the features that are essential for uh, uh, memory-centric architecture. And I uh, uh, thought you'd appreciate this, home, uh, not homo sapien, but homer sapien diagram. Uh, so we'll start from distributed caches because, uh, in my view, it's the bottom of the evolution chain. And uh, just for everyone, I think everybody knows what a cache is, but uh, let's just define the terminology. It's very important that we're all on the same page. Caching means bringing data from uh, storage into memory uh, closer to the processing logic so it could be served faster. So. Uh, uh, that's what a cache is, and caches has been around forever, right? I mean, uh, it's possible even to, date, uh, like to put a date on when the first cache showed up. Uh, but uh, initially, when caching started, uh, the main uh, use case were uh, just uh, local caching of some query results of some key value pairs. Uh, the scenarios that were supported were read mostly. They, the, uh, the caches were not built for right. Uh, operations, uh, and the main goal was to reduce the load on the underlying storage because uh, underlying storages could not cope with the load, and to, uh, Im again, uh, improve the speed of uh, serving requests. Uh, however, the main problem here is that uh, these caches are local uh, to the process, and if you need to store more data than fits in memory, you're out of luck. Uh, so the, you could not cache that data. So as the data grew, uh, the need uh, surfaced for uh, distributed caching. Uh, so distributed caching was introduced with this shared nothing knowledge. And uh, some of the uh, well-known products in distributed caching space are Memcached, Redis, uh, Amazon Elastic Cache. I think it's a cloud-based cloud version of Redis. And, uh, Essentially, what those caching products uh, solved is the ability to store more data that fits in memory, because now you, with a shared nothing architecture, you have a, uh, a notion of data ownership. And collectively, across multiple servers, uh, you have your full data set. So now you can actually scale out. Uh, you have backups, redundant copies, also uh, across the cluster. So it became more resilient. It became uh, uh, more performant, in a way. And it started support, but the main functionality it supported was still very basic. It's like uh, basic key value lookups or uh, maybe something on top of that, uh, maybe some manipulation of the data, but uh, still short on many features that uh, we expect, expect from uh, the distributed computing today. For example, there was no way of querying data. Uh, you, it, uh, distributed caches work only in a client server fashion and uh, the way you query data, you bring the data from a server to the client and process it there. So there's no way to query it. You can only access by key, which is also very limiting because you have to build your own kind of models to be able to query data effectively. There's no transactions. Uh, asset com uh, compliance is not present in distributed caches. So again, if you need to be uh, asset consistent, uh, you could not have it in distributed caching. One uh, of the main problem was synchronization with database, right? If you generally, if you ca caching some data, that means the data comes from somewhere else. Uh, the data is usually stored in a database, uh, 
but now you may can cache your primary storage, but the database, when you update the cache, the database does not get updated automatically. So now you, you have to utilize this pattern called cache aside pattern, where you update your cache and update your database manually. The same goes for reading. You have to uh, read your cache if it's not there, load it from database and store it in your cache. So a uh, very uh, uh, manual way of doing it and uh, uh, modern products actually support a lot of automation there already. Uh, so, and finally, lack of uh, native persistence. So uh, again, most of the distributed in memory product, uh, products will have some persistence, but there will be one problem. They cannot scale beyond what can fit in RAM. Uh, that goes for in-memory caches and many in-memory other products in this evolution chain. So you can only fit, <clears throat> you can only fit as, much of, uh, as much data as you can fit in a RAM across your cluster. For example, if you have, uh, let's say, 64 gig, uh, or let's say 96 gig of RAM, let's round it up to 100 per server. Across 10 servers, you have one terabyte of RAM. Uh, if you need to store two terabytes of RAM, you can't, because that's all you have. You have one terabyte. And so that's one of the uh, limitations of uh, distributed caching approaches. And finally, whenever you bring up the system, you have to again warm up the cache. Uh, without being warmed up, cache does not work. So the warm up time also goes into one of the uh, problems uh, with distributed caches. So again, uh, just to summarize, very useful uh, uh, product. I would say the distributed caches still exist today. They're very useful, very good for cloud deployment, but they have very basic features, very basic functionality. And to address that, uh, we're moving further uh, in an evolution chain. To address that, uh, uh, in memory data grids came, on, uh, came around, uh, e exactly to address the limitations of distributed caches. Uh, essentially, when you think of in memory data grids, uh, think of distributed caches with intelligence, distributed caching with brains. Uh, some of the known vendors of in-memory data grids would be Hazelcast, Gigaspaces, Apache Ignite, there's Apache Geot project also that provides in-memory data grid. And essentially the whole purpose here is to address the shortcoming of a distributed cache. Uh, again, uh, if distributed cache did not support asset transaction, in memory, most in-memory data grids do. Most in-memory data grids do have some sort of query APIs, very limited, and a lot of them are very custom, but uh, they do allow you to query data. One of the mo uh, most utilized feature is event notifications. Uh, you, you can get continuous event updates, continuous event uh, queries. We call them continuous queries. Automatic integration with database, very important. If you walk into any company uh, and you ask them to uh, replace your database, that's a very hard pill, to, a difficult pill to swallow. Uh, databases, uh, RDBA masses, especially in many financials and most of the companies in the world, learned to live with databases probably for the past 20 years. Uh, to come with a proposition where, you know what, uh, let's reap your database and install ours, it's very, uh, it generally doesn't, uh, doesn't fly. So integrating with an existing database and making it scalable is uh, definitely a very nice and very non-intrusive way to integrate uh, with existing data storages. So if uh, today's databases uh, may have uh, scalability problems, you introduce a memory data grid on top of those databases. It's a distributed caching layer with all these features. And uh, uh, essentially uh, what you get is a scalable distributed uh, storage in combination with your existing RDBMS or uh, any other kind of database you have. Uh, the storage, uh, most of the data grids are storage agnostic. So it could be Oracle, it could be MySQL, it could be uh, Cassandra or Mongo. Doesn't matter what database you use. Uh, uh, In-memory data grids generally would be able to integrate with them. And one of the most important features, I think, uh, which is at the core of distributed computing, at the core of in-memory computing, is collocated processing. Uh, if you think about collocated processing, Generally speaking, uh, there are two types, two paradigms, client-server processing and collocated processing. I think you've, you've heard the uh, term collocation uh, many times. If uh, you've heard other Ignite presentations, Ignite, Apache Ignite and Grigin are all about collocation. But I think uh, when you hear the word collocation, you have to really think of it as the only way 
to properly scale in a distributed system. Moving data around in a distributed system is the most expensive operation you can perform. Uh, moving computations around, on the other hand, is a very lightweight network trip. So it's a lot cheaper to take your computation, take your logic, send it to the server where the data resides, do all the processing on that server, and send the result back. And uh, Ignite has uh, all sorts of compute functionality. We started out as a compute grid, not as a data grid. So uh, for a while, we had to com uh, compete in a computer world. And we've built quite an extensive uh, feature set in a, for uh, the computational use cases. So when you collocate your computations with data, that's where you get the real scalability. That's where you get this microsecond and nanosecond type of latencies. Uh, However, in-memory data grids still have their shortcomings. Uh, custom query languages, I mean, uh, you still have to learn them. There's, uh, no, you, there's no SQL, uh, so you, you have to learn the custom API. And most of them do not support joins. Just imagine querying your data without joins, right? I mean, imagine having a customer table or customer object and, or employee object and a company object, and you cannot query all employees that work for the same company in one go. Uh, so within memory data grids, a lot of times you have to execute that query manually. First you query one part, uh, bring the results back, and then you issue another query to query another part. So uh, lack of joins is definitely painful. Lack of native persistence. Again, in memory data grids are very good for uh, integrating uh, with existing databases, but you do have to have existing database. Without existing database, you essentially have just a memory store without uh, any kind of persistence uh, uh, any kind of way to survive restarts, to survive crashes, etc. Uh, there are redundant copies in memory, right? But if your whole cluster goes down, then you would lose your data without persistence. And again, just with uh, distributed caches, you have to warm up on restart. Uh, if you restart your cluster, you have to preload the data from disk into a memory data grid before it becomes operational. So. In order to address some of these problems, for example, SQL and querying, uh, we, we can move to the next step. And uh, 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 the next step would be in memory database. The next step in evolution chain would be in memory databases. So in memory databases actually came around and said, you can still do distributed in memory storage, and you don't have to abandon SQL. SQL uh, can still be used. It's a, essentially, you can think about them as in memory data grids for SQL. Some of the vendors uh, probably would be VoltDB, SAP HANA, Apache Ignite also supports in-memory database use case. And uh, most of them are transactional. So you're using SQL. Most of the uh, uh, SQL uh, in-memory databases are transactional and most of them are scalable, right? However, uh, 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 before I get into shortcoming, one more benefit, collocated joins. Uh, now, when you're using uh, SQL, now you have to think not just collocating computer with data. You also have to have collocation of data with data. Uh, there's a foreign key relationship now. There's a parent table and a child table that you want to query together. For example, in this, uh, in this case, we have country table and CD table. Uh, and uh, in order to query all cities that belong to a certain country, we want to make sure that we collocate country with the cities in that country together. Uh, that means that the data is still distributed. All the countries are equally partitioned across the cluster and cities as well. But cities that belong to a certain country reside on the same server as the country itself. And this way, the joins become local, right? We distribute the query, the joins execute locally, and the results come back. In the absence of this collocation, the query would still work. But you lose the benefit of in-memory computing, of distributed computing. Because now you have to move cross products around and for a larger table, it could be a very large cross product. Uh, essentially, for a query that would take seconds in a normal database, you may take uh, minutes uh, with a non-collocated join. So uh, use, my advice, never use non-collocated joins. Better break your join into several parts if you cannot collocate. Uh, but they're there. Uh, if you need them, you can still utilize them. Uh, for the, most of your application, you should be able to collocate. If you are at 80-20, if you collocate at about 80% of your queries, you're doing very well. Your application will scale well and uh, perform well, and all the queries will execute very fast, many times a lot faster than in other database systems. And uh, 
uh, there will be very little data movement in your application. So the load on the net network would be minimal. However, what, uh, what are the issues uh, that uh, we can face with uh, uh, in-memory databases? In-memory database, uh, when you think about in-memory database, think about it is a place to store data. So it doesn't sit, uh, usually it doesn't sit on top of an existing data store. So whenever you're choosing an in-memory database, you have to actually make a decision to, act uh, to completely get rid of your existing store and uh, put the in-memory database in its place. And now uh, combine that with limitation that uh, you can only store whatever fits in memory. So now if you get getting rid of your existing store, put in a memory database in, in place, and now you have a limit of what, how much data you can store. So that, that's a pretty significant limitation. And uh, uh, a lot of times it becomes a decision uh, making point, whether you can or cannot use in a memory database in your application. But generally, if you can use it, it will provide better performance. Lack of collocated processing. Uh, so in memory databases are, uh, work with SQL. It's an SQL-based system. The way you work with it is by connecting to them with JDBC or ODBC drivers, uh, which essentially make, uh, be behave as a client-server fashion. There's no collocated processing. Some may argue that if you can write a store procedure, you are kind of doing collocated processing. I would argue that store procedure is a very difficult and clumsy way to implement your logic and, uh, and are very limited in what you can do with a store procedure. And of course, uh, last but not least, is uh, lack of native persistence. Uh, again, you can, most of the in-memory systems, in-memory distributed caches, uh, distributed data grids, uh, distributed in-memory databases, all of them will support offloading memory to disk. Essentially, if you pull the plug on the cluster, that system can restart from disk. But you can only offload whatever fits in memory. So if your data set fits in memory, uh, the, you can use uh, in-memory system uh, with, uh, as a system of record. If, you data, if your data set does not fit in memory, in this case, you definitely uh, need to look for another solution because in this case, uh, in-memory database cannot become your system of record. You have to have something else where you would store your data. And uh, that moves us to another uh, step in evolution, which is distributed databases. Uh, now, I mean, from, a time st uh, from a, uh, the time frame standpoint, it's very hard to say what came before what. Uh, maybe distributed databases came before in-memory databases, maybe the other way around. The focus here is that they support a completely different feature set. There are several types of distributed databases. Uh, on the market. Uh, some of the most known ones are no SQL databases. They support distributed persistent. Everybody probably here knows what eventual consistency is. So no SQL databases are usually not transactional or support transaction in a very handicapped form. Uh, generally speaking, if you go between servers, most of the distributed uh, no SQL databases will not support, support that use case transactionally. If you have to, for example, do a transfer from account A into account B and they reside on different servers, at that point uh, you will run into consistency issues. Some of the known uh, vendors, Apache Cassandra, Mongo, Couchbase, there are quite a few. The, uh, essentially think about it as a distributed storage. It can definitely be used as a system of record. So you can definitely replace one database with another and uh, sleep well that your data actually will not be lost or will not be lost in eventually, in eventually consistent systems. Uh, but uh, again, there's no memory component. You're still limited that now uh, it's a distributed system, but now you gave up on the memory story. So now you cannot do collocated processing. You're still talking to it in a client server fashion. The processing is not collocated. Uh, there's uh, no SQL usually. That's uh, uh, generally uh, no SQL databases support very limited SQL. Uh, for example, Cassandra does have SQL. Uh, it looks like SQL, but it doesn't have joins. Without joins, I would say SQL is very much handicapped. Uh, I mean, most of the queries you just cannot do. Uh, so, uh, and lack of a memory processing. Uh, 
another family of distributed databases are uh, probably would fit in a new SQL kind of uh, uh, arena, and uh, essentially it's distributed SQL databases. Uh, so now they're m mainly transactional. They're mostly transactional. They're, uh, they do support SQL, and they do support distributed joins. So now that problem is solved. Most of them support collocated distributed joins because non-collocated just work too slow. Uh, they're cloud native. Uh, you can deploy them on the cloud. They scale very well. They're full torrent. But again, uh, it's a client server. There's no collocated processing. And in my view, if you don't have a collocated processing, you do not have a memory computing. You are not processing your data in a distributed system effectively. Uh, you're moving data around and therefore uh, the latencies and performance will not be as fast as they could have been with a collocated processing. Uh, so also think about this. I mean, these are distributed database systems. In order to make them perform faster, because they all work off of disk, in order to make them perform faster, you probably do still need to deploy a distributed caching layer on top of them. Even, for example, today I know many projects where Ignite is deployed on top of Apache Cassandra as a distributed caching layer. The problem with that is uh, when you do that, uh, Ignite will partition its data in a certain way. Cassandra will partition its data in a completely different way. In order to uh, preload caches effectively and do collocation, you're actually still going across network in a very chaotic uh, fashion. Uh, there's very, it's very difficult to properly collocate uh, two uh, distributed system together. So uh, uh, one of the problems with using distributed databases and distributed uh, in-memory data grids or distributed in-memory databases together is being able to collocate the pieces of data together so you could actually do collocated processing. Uh, most of the time it's not possible. And that's, uh, definite, uh, that's the reason why, uh, main reason, one of the main reasons why in Apache Ignite we came up, came up with a memory-centric approach. So the memory-centric approach is essentially there to solve uh, uh, most of the issues that I've mentioned, most of the shortcomings that I've mentioned in other distributed systems. At the core of a memory uh, storage, we have a memory at the core of a memory architecture, we have a memory-centric storage. What does memory-centric mean? It means that it can work equally well with memory, with pure memory as a store, or it can integrate with disk in, uh, in a native way. If you would like to have disk uh, just as a copy of memory, it supports it. If you would like to scale beyond what you can store in memory, it can also support it. So you can now use it as a system of record. And one of the, uh, another important thing here is because both of those, persistence and memory, come within one product, within Apache Ignite. Memory and persistence are collocated. You can actually store, let's say if you have 64 gig of RAM and maybe a terabyte of SSD uh, and you have 10 servers, across 10 servers you will be able to store 10 terabytes of data. And you would still be able locally on every server to cache that local data in memory within that 64 gig. Whatever the hottest data is will be cached in the 64 gig. The advantage of this approach, again, collocated processing. You can still send computation to a server node and it will process all the data on that server locally. So you're still getting into the use case when you don't have to move data around. You may have to load data into memory from disk, but you definitely do not have to move the data across the network, which makes your solution much more scalable and which uh, makes uh, the latencies much lower. Uh, Ignite is probably the only distributed systems that, uh, the only distributed system in the world that supports this type of deployment. Where you could, uh, it's a, think about it as a distributed cache and distributed database in one product. And, uh, and that's where you get most of the scalability. And of course, all the APIs that come with it. I mean, we definitely want to support more than just one way to talk to the data. So we have SQL, we have key value, uh, and a lot of other features that can come with other components like transactions, compute, computational capabilities. We have service grid, we have continuous learning, machine learning framework with deep learning features added to it. Uh, we have streaming APIs, et cetera, et cetera. And we also can integrate with third party database. So if you do not want to use Ignite as a database, you can still put it on top of existing database. That makes Ignite very non-intrusive 
when you try to integrate it with other, uh, with your existing systems. Place it on top of your database. Uh, uh, learn how to work with Ignite APIs, uh, whether it's SQL, whether it's key value, transactions, et cetera. And at some point, when you actually feel comfortable to phase out a third party database and use Ignite Persistence, it's a configuration switch. You don't have to change your code, you don't have to change your API, you don't have to introduce new products. All you have to do is change configuration to enable persistence. And all the data that is stored in Ignite will start getting persisted on, onto disk. So let's look a little deeper into uh, memory-centric storage. Again, uh, when you work just with pure memory, transactional capabilities are much easier. That's why memory data grids uh, and memory databases uh, are very careful to support just that use case. Because you can be transactional relatively easy because if uh, server goes down, it restarts, there's no state. The memory, uh, the memory state is low, so you don't have to worry about stale state. Uh, once you introduce persistence, uh, that changes. Now, if a server crashes and uh, you bring it back up, you now have to worry whether is the state on this server, is the state on disk, uh, consistent uh, uh, in a transactional sense with other uh, nodes. So if you had a transaction that was ongoing, you want to make sure whether that transaction is fully committed across all the participating nodes or fully rolled back. And the way to achieve that is to introduce write-ahead logs. So you uh, Ignite Persistent Store does have write-ahead logging, just like uh, most of the on-disk storages. And the reason for that is because appending to a storage is much faster than uh, uh, doing a random writes in, into, uh, uh, into a file. So once you keep appending, then at some point you have to copy that write ahead log into the main storage. That process is called checkpointing. Checkpointing happens uh, probably like every one or two minutes, but it's a configurable time frame. So every so often you would checkpoint your data uh, from uh, a write ahead log into the uh, main storage. Uh, and uh, uh, another point that uh, we had to consider when we were moving into this architecture, and which came out, by the way, with Ignite 2.0 about two years ago, is uh, to make sure that both memory and disk have the same representation of data. Because we actually have absolutely identical format of storing data on disk and memory, we don't have to serialize and deserialize whenever moving uh, pages uh, uh, to disk or into memory. Uh, essentially, once we, we just load them, but we don't have to deserialize them. So there's uh, very li little cost to that. And uh, all the data in memory is stored off heap. So most of the distributed in memory systems will store data on heap and introduce off heap as a secondary storage. In Ignite, by default, you use off heap. So as, if you start up Ignite, uh, can we? I'll ask you, let's hold off the questions all the way to the end. I have a couple more slides. You don't have to wait for too long. Uh, so off heap storage, essentially, why is it good? Because Java notoriously is not very good of dealing, uh, for, uh, with dealing with large memory spaces. And uh, off heap helps you avoid uh, uh, garbage collection pauses. So you can literally configure 10, 10 gigabytes on heap or 16 gigabytes on heap and uh, terabyte off heap. And that would be a normal Ignite uh, deployment. And of course, uh, memory and disk are co-located. Uh, the data is distributed. The whole data set is distributed across the servers. Uh, collectively, on uh, disk, you have your full data set. And in memory, whatever is uh, being cached. So the data set size is limited by the amount of disk space you have across your cluster. Uh, and uh, Another point to, uh, I want to make here is how you can use a memory-centric architecture. There are different ways you can configure it. And uh, you never have just one use case in your project. You always have some data that is, uh, there needs to be very performant that you operate on at a very high rate. Uh, you have data that is historical and you don't want to access it too often, but you still want to have it available for some data warehousing needs, et cetera. So the data, uh, and that's why Ignite supports uh, different levels, different ways you can configure your memory and disk. For example, you can configure Ignite as a pure in-memory store. No, uh, no persistent store at all. Uh, 
it will uh, have redundant copies in memory, so it will survive individual uh, server crashes, but it will not survive uh, full cluster restart. You can configure Ignite with in-memory and third-party database. So if you already have your storage, just put Ignite on top of it. Ignite will perfectly integrate uh, with your database. We provide automatic integration out of the box with most of their RDBMS systems, with uh, Apache Cassandra. We can also integrate with Mongo, et cetera. So automatic write-through, automatic read-through. And if your storage is transactional, then Ignite transaction will merge with the database transaction. So if you have an Oracle or MySQL, then uh, whenever you execute a tra distributed transaction, it will either commit as one unit together with the database or roll back as one unit. If you have non-transactional storage, then nothing we can do. We cannot make your storage uh, transactional. Then there is another mode. Memory and disk are uh, of the same size. That's a standard distributed uh, in-memory uh, use case. Most of the in-memory data grids and in-memory database support that. Essentially, the whole point here, you get the in-memory performance, but you uh, also survive full cluster restart. And the most important use case, in my view, is the memory-centric use case, where you can scale beyond what you can fit in memory. We call it memory-centric. Uh, but you still collocate the memory data with the disk data. So memory cache sits on top of the, uh, on the same server as the uh, data stored on disk. So you can still do the collocated processing and you can still execute the transactions and you can still uh, uh, get the utmost scalability, utmost performance out of your system without moving data around across the network. Uh, I think this concept alone is uh, one of the most powerful concepts of memory-centric architecture. And uh, uh, as well heard about HTAP uh, architecture, HTAP basically means hybrid transaction analytical processing. If you heard uh, Abe uh, in his keynote, he also mentioned HTAP. There's also another name called HOPE. Uh, but essentially a term created by analysts. Uh, I think Gartner created this term. All it means that the system has to be able to uh, do OLTP and OLAP together. Uh, if you think about most of those uh, use cases, a lot of times you would purposely want to separate them because most of the OLAP systems may execute high, like high uh, difficult, like uh, uh, heavy, heavy queries on your data, and it may slow down the transactional performance of the operational uh, system, uh, may hurt your SLA. So a lot of times you would purposely separate them, and then you would have ETL from one system to another. However, you can still do in inline analytics. You can still do uh, lightweight processing in uh, OLTP system that will allow you to do lightweight analytics. Uh, on uh, your operational data. You can still uh, uh, have a most popular product uh, like uh, calculated for you. You can still have an average price uh, for, for a certain family of products. Certain things that would allow you to make decisions faster, for example, on the e-commerce side, right? Uh, if, you, uh, if you do that. So uh, OLTP and the lab do coexist, but uh, uh, can coexist and can live separately. The thing is, in memory-centric architecture, memory-centric product fits perfectly. Either way, if you want to have a portion of your data on disk, portion of your data in memory, uh, memory-centric architecture supports it. Most importantly, you can transact between the two. You can do joins between the two. Even though one is purely in memory and another one is, is on disk, you can execute SQL query between the two and actually do some analytics on it. You can also... Uh, uh, make sure that the data is moved from one to another, for example, in a transactional form. Or uh, you could ETL from one to another if you, do, if you want to keep them completely separate. So HTAP use case actually is very, uh, is perfect for memory-centric architecture. And finally, uh, this is my last slide. Uh, I, I, I like this slide because it actually shows most of the uh, evolution, most of the storages today. And the main point here is that Whenever uh, you have to pick a, a distributed storage solution, right? Uh, if you have to pick something, this is, by the way, all, is also available on Ignite homepage, on Ignite website. Uh, we have this table. Uh, and from left to right, it also, if you move from left to right, you're also historically moving time-wise. RDB, RDBMS was one of the first. Uh, RDBMS, uh, we know what RDBMS systems support. Uh, SQLs, transaction, but they're not scalable. They're not distributed. They do not support key value or collocated processing. Uh, 
So in order to make them distributed, uh, we decided to have no SQL databases. But we said, you know what, we're gonna make them distributed, but now transactions got too expensive. Let's not have transactions, let's have eventually consistency, eventual consistency. So we're now sacrificing transactions. And we also uh, don't have collocated processing, we also uh, don't have support for SQL. So now you sacrifice SQL as well. So in order to address some of it, we came out with in-memory data grids. We said, okay, uh, distributed transactions can be implemented and can be fast, but now, uh, on disk transactions disappeared, persistent transactions disappeared. So now uh, you lost your persistence capability and now you have to integrate uh, with uh, other uh, existing databases. Or in-memory databases came out and said, you know what, distributed SQL doesn't have to be slow. We will have a distributed SQL, but again, no, no key value, no collocated processing, no persistence. So wherever, wherever you go, you're making concessions. Wherever you go, you're making sacrifices. And the whole point uh, when we were uh, coming out with this memory-centric approach was to make sure that our, store will, our storage will remove most of these limitations. So if you use grid gain on, and ignite, I'm not suggesting that uh, it's a silver bullet and all your dreams will come true, but uh, most of the sacrifices that you have to make when using existing systems you don't have to make when using uh, a memory-centric approach. Uh, and on top of that, you're getting multiple products in one. You're getting a memory data grid, you're getting a memory database, a distributed cache, and a distributed database all in one product. So it's a very universal approach and supports most of the use cases in one API, in one product. And that's it for me. Uh, if you have any questions, yes, please. Okay, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. All right, so very good questions. Uh, first question, uh, I'll repeat it, uh, near caches. Uh, will they ever, uh, will they support off heap? Because now they're on heap. For those who don't not know, if you look at a distributed architecture, oops, what did I do? Uh, if you look at a distributed architecture, essentially think about it as a distributed server side cluster with strong caching capabilities. However, uh, most of the, if you're accessing data from the client side, uh, the data still has to go in a client server form the data still has to go across the network, in which case, uh, in which case you might want to cache some data locally on the client side. Those type of caches in Ignite are called near caches. Uh, they are purposely on heap uh, because we never thought that they would be big enough to create a garbage collection problem because they're sitting on the client side and uh, generally it should be a smaller cache than, a, than the main storage. Uh, if they're fully transactional, support all, all, all the same f uh, feature set. So uh, to, say, uh, to say that uh, they do they have to be on, off heap, I haven't seen a strong reason for it. If you do have that use case, please send it to the dev list on Apache Ignite. We'll definitely consider it. There's no technical or architectural limitation that prevents us from uh, having those uh, caches uh, uh, off heap. But today they're on heap. Uh, the second question was, is there any, uh, I think, uh, uh, yeah, is there any reason uh, why, is, is there any performance degradation, I think, if you're using off-heap, and is there any case when you would have to use on-heap instead of off-heap? So off-heap memory is memory. Uh, it's still byte addressable, it's still a pointer access away, it's very fast. We store data in a binary format, that's a GNIDE-specific format, and it's cross-platform. And it's very efficient, it's much more compact than most uh, of the serialization, including Java serialization. Uh, one, uh, if you're using Ignite in a client-server fashion, you would never have to use on-heap uh, cache because you're still sending data over network, and given that off-heap has this data already serialized, it's very, very inexpensive to put it on the wire. We don't have to do anything, we just write it as is. Uh, however, if you're doing collocated processing, right, uh, which we definitely recommend you do, and you have 
heavy objects, that uh, large objects that are too expensive to serialize or deserialize, in that case, we do support on-heap caches on top of off-heap caches, right? So off-heap will still remain the main storage, but you could put a smaller, create a smaller on-heap cache for certain, for certain use case. Uh, so yes, uh, there is a use case like that. Uh, multiple hands, start here. No, but uh, so the question is how do you survive full cluster restart in, in a cloud? So in a cloud, you would have to use Elastic Block Storage, for example, on Amazon, and Elastic Block Storage is not going to be gone, and it will survive cluster restart. So when you restart, you just remap to the Elastic to the Block Storage that you have your data stored. As a matter of fact, grid gain, uh, cloud as a uh, grid gain as a service in the cloud, which is available on Grid Gain website, you can try it. Uh, about in about two weeks, we'll support that feature. Okay. All right. Okay. So, uh, uh, by the way, everybody will get a chance. We still uh, we're good on time. We get uh, we still have about eight more minutes. So in the trade off, sometimes uh, if you have to get the data from the local disk. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, I always suggest to use memory because in this case you would, uh, so the question is, uh, would you have two partitions in memory on two servers uh, or on one server, but uh, because they don't fit, they would have to be on disk. My recommendation would be in memory on two servers because memory is faster than disk. And here you, you're still making, you, it looks like you're making two requests, but you're making them in parallel. So you get parallel processing on two servers, so it will be faster execution than sequential memory and disk on one server. So my recommendation, if you can cache the whole world, cache the whole world. Uh, use memory as much as you can. Uh, more questions? Yes, please. Ignite supports that automatically. You so uh, the question is, uh, why do we have to have on-heap cache on top of off-heap cache? Why not just have on-heap and that's it? If you, uh, there's a reason for that. Uh, architecturally, Ignite, uh, the uh, representation of the data, you know, we have a page-based architecture. The representation of the data within pages is identical in memory and on disk. So uh, that's our main storage, where that premise has to be always true in order for that storage to work. Could be index pages, could be data pages, could be metadata pages, but they have to, uh, there should be no serialization in between. Uh, so that was number one performance consideration. And on heap, adds a small on-heap overhead, but uh, performance-wise, uh, that's a read mostly use case uh, for on-heap caches. So performance-wise, you, you will not see any performance degradation by adding on-heap cache on top of off-heap cache. So from architectural standpoint, it was very beneficial for us to choose this approach. Yes. So because uh, the main reason for using off-heap storage was to make sure that uh, we can natively support persistence in a very performant way. Uh, that uh, gentleman was first, yes? All right, so do I understand the question correctly that you're saying on, in a cloud, the disk cannot be local, right? Uh, 
that's the limitation of the cloud. I thought, unfortunately, whenever you can have a local disk, please do. In the cloud, you can't. So you have to uh, use something like uh, Elastic Block Store on Amazon. But you still have, if you have 30 servers, you still have 30 block, 30 block storages. When you retrieve data in parallel, you have 30 parallel disks serving data. It will be a lot faster than having all that data in one disk. Even if you're doing it from multiple threads, you're still sequentially accessing the disk. So uh, there's still a lot of benefit to, to using Elastic Block Store on a cloud. You, do you still have a question? I'll, So the question is, is there a difference in the way you would handle uh, uh, fault tolerance, right? And transaction consistency uh, if uh, between pure in-memory or in-memory plus disk. Uh, there's huge difference. Again, the main difference is uh, that when an in-memory node crashes, when it comes back up, you do not have to worry about state. So you do not have to worry about what if uh, some state is an inconsistent state. So it started, uh, starts anew, it starts blank, and you just rebalance some data and continue. Much easier. Now, when you do have persistence, and persistence could be bigger than memory, you have to worry about states. And that's now, now what, with persistence, you would have to add write ahead log. So for example, even today, Ignite Pure in memory does not use write ahead logs. But once you add persistence, we start utilizing write ahead logs because we need to be consistent. Right. All right, so the question is how do we uh, handle reliability between uh, in a distributed cluster? You have redundant copies for every key. Not redundant copies of the whole server, but every key on that server may reside uh, as a backup on some other servers. That means that whenever you have a write uh, uh, transaction, the backup copies are also enlisted in the same transaction, and on those backup copies, you would also have them written to the right ahead log on those servers. Whenever a crash happens, we reconcile those, uh, upon restart, we reconcile those right ahead logs. Is it a, a, a pair of servers or is it a distributed? It's a distributed, and um, right ahead logs are distributed. There is no single, everything is distributed. Everything is, uh, think about in the purest form, if you don't have backups, in the purest form, it's absolutely shared nothing, including the right ahead logs. All right, so in a, the question is, uh, I think uh, you're asking how we handle primary and backup copies uh, in general. So in Ignite, uh, for every key, uh, there is an owner server. Uh, there will be one owner node, that will be a primary node. And then the second owner will be backup, and then there's a third backup, as many as you like. It's a configurable parameter. So when, whenever a primary copy is updated, we have several modes to update backups. Uh, you can update them synchronously or asynchronously. So if you update them synchronously, then they're updated at the same time as a primary copy, and the transaction commits uh, only when all the copies are updated. Asynchronously, then uh, the backups will be updated later, depending on the consistency you need. More questions? Yes, please. So how does foreign constraint get preserved during update? Is that, uh, well, generally speaking, you don't change, uh, just like in a regular database, I think, uh, when you update, you don't update foreign keys, right? You update other data. If you update foreign keys, then you're uh, now relating to another record uh, that, that you weren't previously relating before. So Ignite would just, instead of uh, having foreign re relation to this record, will have a foreign relation to a different record. It's all indexed. So it's all very fast. Yeah. Oh, I understand now. Uh, 
Are you asking whether Ignite enforces? Yeah. No, Ignite does not enforce foreign key constraint. It will index, it will make sure that you can join between parent and child fast, but uh, the enforcing is on you. And the main, there's a reason for that, by the way. Just think about uh, enforcing it between nodes. Every update, if you're updating 1,000 keys, for every key would have to send a distributed broadcast message to the whole cluster uh, asking, is something violated, right? So like, for example, if you have a unique column, for example, is a, this column unique across the cluster? Uh, so uh, for that reason, we decided not to enforce it, but now we're adding enforcing for collocated foreign parent and foreign keys. So that feature will uh, be implemented and is coming. All right, I think we're almost out. One minute, 20 seconds. Well, I, I hear what you're saying. So is there a plan to support materialized views uh, in, a, in Ignite? Uh, think about a distributed system that is partitioned. And uh, now you create this uh, view that uh, got a little bit from here, got a little bit from here, got a little bit from here. Where would you put it? And then how do you collocate? So you would lose many benefits of a distributed parallel processing if you start introducing that into your architecture. Uh, I was, uh, maybe there is an efficient way to do it, but I don't see a simple way, uh, like a straightforward way to do it. So there are no immediate plans to support it. Uh, last question? Yes? So when we have persistence for the bot, and we're loading the end of the cache, does that mean it will start writing to disk right away? It, uh, right away. If you have persistence enabled, uh, disk is your primary store. It doesn't swap to disk when memory fills. Disk is always has full state. Is there a way to do that? Use uh, volatile storage? Is there? Uh, so the, is there a question is, can we use memory first and then disk? You always use memory first. Whenever you write to disk, uh, you can configure your operating system. We, can, uh, you, we have this uh, mode called log only. When we write to operating system buffer and have it flash later. And the performance overhead of that is very minimal. Like you would, with persistence, probably 5, 10% overhead. So it's. You keep all the data at all times. If you have persistence enabled, you will never lose your data, no matter what. So then how much is allocated in memory? Whatever you allocate. Okay. As much memory as you give. My suggestion, give as much as you can. The more you cache, the faster it gets. And is there a way for me to like, prioritize what space you need? You tell us how much memory you want to allocate and how much disk. That's exactly how much we will use. We will always process off of memory, and we can persist to disk asynchronously. They will always, last 100 records will always be in memory no matter what because they're the last 100 records you access. The first 100 may have been uh, uh, evicted from memory because memory is full. But uh, the hardest data, the recently accessed data will be in memory. Make sense? All right. Uh, last question, uh, I don't know, it's, okay, if it's quick. So how big of an object that you can store in Ignite and uh, what are the performance considerations? I would say think about this object has to be sent across the network, right? So if you're sending a terabyte across the network as one object, you're not doing it right, right? So something is uh, uh, definitely off in, in the design. However, you don't, uh, on the access, you don't have to access everything. If you're using binary format, you can access specific keys so you don't have to deserialize the whole object. So first you have to read uh, the disk. Correct. Correct. Uh, it, would, uh, it probably would load several pages. An object like that would span multiple pages. And then you extract. Because you first have to get the object, and then you access a field. You cannot access a field before you get the object. So in that order, there's no other way. I think I have to finish. I'm available at Grid Game Booth if you have more questions. Thank you.